as part of the ABIP Site Location webinar series, I'm presenting a view on future building system modeling and simulation. So I'm starting with trends and vision, and they follow the big overarching trend of electrification and digitization of the building delivery process. So decarbonization, resilience and digitization poses new tool requirements. On the top left, we see a schematic diagram of a new system that has one water loop that's tempered around 22 degrees Celsius. And so that provides a heating and cooling to a building. So if a zone overheats slightly, it's going to be cooled. And if it's a little bit below this 22 degrees Celsius, it's being heated up to meet the heating set point. So those systems are very efficient. They have been built in Sweden, but they do require new approaches for uh, properly model them and develop controls. We see somewhat related trends also on the district heating and cooling system, where we have now new fifth generation combined district heating and cooling system that have one tempered loop that provide a reservoir for, of which uh, Buildings can exchange heat and cooling, and at every building, temperature is boosted up or down to exactly what that building needs. And so that we get very high efficiency. We can model other built-out systems, and we can share waste heat and waste source potential as well as storage potential between different buildings or between different districts of a city. On the other hand, uh, digitization of control delivery processes allows us to uh, share best practice control sequences, embed them in a formal control delivery process with an end-to-end -end verification where the commissioning agent using a digital twin to verify that the as-installed control sequence meet the design intent. This approach also allows us then to largely share control sequences and best in practice, not only within a company, but also within the whole building industry and successively improve those sequences. Also, building to grid integration and load shifting poses requirements to couple thermal simulation with electrical system to do a holistic assessment that then enables us to develop uh, new control sequences that start optimizing across different energy carriers. So what changes really? So as renewable and electrification increases, temperature and time matters much more. So 40 years ago, we were burning fossil fuel, for example, in an oil furnace, and uh, second law efficiency was not a big consideration. In these systems, high temperature differences decoupled control loops, and they also incurred exergy losses, but nobody really cared much about it. That completely changes now as we move toward vapor compression cycles for heating. So now second law efficiency becomes very important because in some of those low temperature heating systems, one Kelvin temperature difference costs around 4% energy efficiency. So at the same time, as we want to reduce this temperature difference for efficiency reasons, we start coupling control loops much more tightly with each other. So we have a tight coupling between uh, the generation side and the distribution side. Similar on the storage capacity side, about 40 years ago, we built this glass ballast. Uh, energy storage was not that big of a concern. But now we really need to think about how do we do load shaping through storage? And how do we integrate new storage devices? For example, uh, uh, phase change material as part of billing envelope, integration of EVs or batteries, or also get a higher utilization out of investments in bore field or in uh, conventional uh, water storage tanks. So here we have an optimization question because uh, high temperature differences, they do increase energy storage capacity, but as I mentioned above in the slide, they also incur exergy losses. So there's an optimum in terms of how high do we have this temperature difference to utilize the storage, but not pay with too high uh, efficiency uh, penalties. The building needs to transition from static efficiency consideration to dynamic control that allows us to integrate grid, PV, electrical vehicle, waste heat sources, and also storage devices. So today's building automation systems, they typically control the track set points, but they lack awareness of marginal CO2 emissions of the grid, 
evolution of the weather and also anticipated future loads. Where we want to get to in the future are really buildings that do uh, building to grid integration that provide services to the electrical grid for load shifting, load shedding. We also want to uh, move toward the combined district scale heating, cooling and storage devices because often districts are the scale where it's possible to leverage this investment needed to provide uh, storage devices and the proper controls of them. Those systems, they also allow them to do a waste heat recuperation within a district and, for example, share different resources for renewable integration, such as uh, biogas or power to gas devices. We also need to think about energy hubs that integrate the grid, building and transportation and provide an optimization across this, these different energy vectors. For example, if there is an excess uh, electricity on the grid, you could make the decision to either produce uh, gas through power to gas or store the excess electricity by running a chiller to provide uh, cool water, store it in a tank and use it later to cool buildings. So we have to figure out how do we do an optimization across these different energy vectors in order to uh, operate the system as a whole in the most optimal way. The underlying technology for that is really model predictive control, which inherently allows us to make a prediction about the future evolution of the state, taking into account the weather predictions as well as the future price signals, and start optimizing either within a system or across different systems, and then feed the optimized control signal back into the actual energy system and redo this calculation maybe every 15 minutes or every half an hour, or in some cases also much faster every uh, few minutes. So let's step back a moment and uh, consider what's really needed from uh, energy simulation tools. So as we saw, building a really complex system that need to integrate various processes. So what we want to arrive at at the end is that we can schematically define any building, HVAC and control systems that need to be simulated, optimized, analyzed and operated. So what that means in terms of input from a digital planning process is that we do have different sources, for example, building information model, we need to be able to also process manufacturer catalogs in an electronic format, such as being developed through ASHRAE standard 205. We also need to provide schematic editor, so uh, users can plug and play different components or subsystems and combine them to new system architectures. We want to have special purpose graphical user interface to lower the complexity to access this technology and also integrate with autonomous modeling or artificial intelligence methods. On the other end, in terms of the application, of course we want to do a simulation as we do always, but we also want to be able to optimize such systems. So we want to generate optimization code either directly out of those uh, formulations or through a transformation into other forms. We need to do analysis of those systems, so we need to integrate them with code compliance, but also with visualizations and with other uh, data processing approaches that allows us to see patterns of a good design and improve the design through simulation. And we also need to be able to support operations, for example, do code generation, either for exporting control sequences or for doing model predictive control, or for doing hardware in the loop, or use models as a digital twin, where we suddenly have uh, some runtime uh, performance that becomes very important. So there are certain requirements now on the models that express the behavior of such uh, systems and also the solution methods. So because we want to uh, simulate any building systems, we really need to uh, develop libraries that are reusable, that allows us to exchange models and combine them to form new systems and do that in a standardized format. Because we want to move our digital twins, being able to support them over the lifetime of a building, which is easily 20 to 30 or even 50 years. So use of standards really is important to provide here some stability uh, that allows us to evolve those systems together with the building. Because we are dealing with building simulation, there are certain methods like partial differential equation for heat and moisture transport in building fabrics, 
or ray tracing for daylight simulation that are being used in Dayland themselves very, very well to parallelize code. On the HVAC and control systems, we typically deal with a hybrid differential algebraic system of equations. So here we really need a computer algebra that allows us to generate efficient runtime code that takes into account the sparsity of the system and also do a lot of symbolic manipulation, for example, for index reduction in certain systems. So luckily, we are not really the only community that deals with simulation. So simulation is used in a lot of different uh, engineering applications. And what's shown here is really the evolution of simulation as characterized by Dirk Zimmer in a talk for the Modelica community. So in the past, we were focusing on simulation. So we had a numerical solver development for ordinary differential equation system. Afterwards, we focused more on modeling. So we had a graphical method to combine different systems together that sometimes led, lent themselves to differential algebraic equations. And there was significant advances on the model compiler technologies. More lately, there was a focus on tool integration, for example, co-simulation that allows us to combine different domain-specific simulation that gave rise to development like the functional mockup interface standard and also model-based system engineering that embeds those models and workflows within a formal process to develop systems. Where we are heading in the future is really toward the autonomous modeling, where we wanna have modeling just behind the hood of other applications that uh, allows us then to compose such systems uh, through uh, easy to use graphical user interface. In some cases, we may have automatic model generation based on artificial, artificial intelligence methods. So you really need to automate the whole process going from modeling to simulation, analysis, and optimization. So system representation really plays a key role here. The languages that we are using, they really shape the way how we can think about system and it determines what we can do with those uh, models. So what is really needed to get to scale from the point of view of technology? So from the modeling side, on the one side, we need a robust foundational science. So we need to have approaches that are solid, grounded in mathematics, in physics that express the behavior of those systems, in controls, and also in uh, computer science that then allows us to combine those approaches to generate, uh, for example, simulation code. We also need to have robust standardized technologies to invest in. So we need to have software standards and hardware standards. Software standards in particular now for the modeling and optimization so that you can build up those ecosystems of tools that build on top of each other and that last then over the new next few decades and allows us to integrate with advances, not just from the building community, but more importantly, also from other industrial sectors that deal with modeling, simulation, and optimization. Then for the design engineer, we need plug and play system level design also so that we can use these Lego blocks and build up systems for buildings or for districts. They need to embed uh, energy codes but also integrate into standardized workflows and allows us to not only do the design of those systems, but also reuse those systems for the operation and also for the construction. So uh, digitized uh, uh, building delivery processes. So one big uh, problem that we are facing with most of today's building energy simulation tools is that they are using procedures to describe engineered systems. So today's uh, simulation programs that we are often using in the building industry, they are basically procedural in a sense. There's uh, classes with a class name, they embed data, and they have procedures that are called process input data and uh, output uh, some new uh, data that are computed in these uh, routines. But there's really no need for doing such an uh, implementation of code that's completely oriented based on how computer process data. On the other hand, equation-based methods, they are much closer to the physics. So 
And you can consider, for example, a heat conductor. A heat conductor can be described by those uh, mathematical equation for conservation of energy and uh, how much uh, heat flows depending on the temperature difference. And then we have two surfaces that expose heat flow rate and temperature. So that can be formulated in this uh, simple system of equation and there are similar formulations, for example, for flow that goes through components with conservation of mass flow rate. And uh, we are creating the pressure then that uh, is dependent on the flow rate. So if we are considering now a computer code in procedural languages, we are typically ending up in block diagram, like shown on the top right part of this graphic. So we have a set of input data and they produce a set of output data. So in an abstract way, we get this input-output dependency, and that's basically all that's available if you use procedural languages. But there's really no need to impose this uh, procedure anymore in computer code. So we really have to ask ourselves, why do we impose this input-output causality? So if you're looking at the physical formulation, there's really no causality here. We cannot distinguish whether the temperature changes because of the heat flow rate or whether the heat flows because of the temperature difference. So why do we impose uh, causality when we uh, generate computer code in terms of uh, function calls or object-oriented implementation of code? The consequences of those uh, procedural approaches is that we can't really reason about the code and it becomes much harder to uh, define systems. So as an illustration, consider this very simple model here where we want to show that the model representation really impacts readability, composability, and also reusability of the code, and then subsequently the efficiency of the code that's being generated. So let's consider a very simple example like shown on the top right here where we have a convection a heat conduction and a feedback control loop that regulates how much heat is being added to one of the surface. We can now choose to implement that with a block diagram like shown in blue on the top left of the graphic or with an equation-based language like shown on the right hand side here. Both implementations have exactly the same mathematical behavior. So both are identical in terms of the result that they are producing. But I would challenge you that the uh, block diagram in blue on the left is uh, really in a form that does not allow you to recognize immediately what is being simulated. Whereas on the right hand side, you can distinguish now the boundary condition that is acting on a convection model. Then you have two heat conductor models, two mass elements for energy storage. And then on the right, you have the feedback control loop with a sensor, a control gain and the source that uh, injects heat, indicated with the red line here, on the mass one. So now consider that you want to make a change to this model and to not inject heat at the mass one, but inject it on the solid surface of the convection model. In the block diagram, you are going to try to understand now how to modify that model, and you're adding new components, like indicated in green, that did not exist originally. You also remove certain components as indicated with red. So you essentially start reconfiguring the uh, significant part of the block diagram. In equation-based languages, all you have to do is literally delete that uh, red line that uh, connects the source with the mass one and draw a new line indicated in green here that connects the source with the surface of this uh, heat conductor. That's all that's needed. So it's very reusable and immediately clear how to modify those systems. So the underlying question is really, again, can we model as we are building systems with Lego? So can we use the substrate, build up building blocks, and have composition rules that allow us to make models of buildings and district energy systems? The answer is yes. So the, our substrates are basically the equations that are formulated in a textual language here. But uh, a key thing to pay attention is that we are just defining here the time rate of change of temperature, but not how the equations are being solved. We embed then those uh, equations in uh, icons. We have composition rules that allow us, for example, to connect heat parts among different uh, 
blocks from a heat transfer library in order to build up those heat transfer models. So that's a, a fundamental departure of how we have been modeling uh, systems in the past. So in the past, we are writing uh, routines, whether it's in Fortran or in C or in Python, doesn't really matter from that point of view. But we basically started writing routines that embed then the physics and the solution methods. And they were really in a form that did not allow us to uh, analyze those system of equations. And that made composition to new systems very hard. In the next step, we moved toward the block diagram modeling, but that's essentially just a, a graphical approach of the uh, above implementation. But now with equation-based languages, we really have an opportunity to completely change how we model such systems. A key underlying uh, mantra of this approach is the so-called separation of concerns. So we are clearly separating modeling from actual computation. So in modeling, we specify the system. So we have, for example, our building that is represented by heat conductors and fluid flow elements. We are using for that graphical modeling approaches that have underlying a causal equations, but we are also allowing algorithmic code, which is used, for example, to implement control sequences, which is essentially really procedural code. And we can call, uh, for example, external functions, such as to uh, implement computational fluid dynamics. The computation then uses those uh, equ underlying equations and uh, generates code through uh, code translators. And there can be different code. So we can still generate code for the time domain simulation. But we can also generate code for real-time operation where we have predictable memory and computing time and, for example, guaranteed no floating point errors. We may generate different code for optimization that allows us to get a gradient or do symbolic processing, for example, for collocation methods. We also uh, can generate code is in a new uh, standard called functional mockup interface that allows us to do a co-simulation or model exchange in a way that's uh, tool independent and allows us then to build up larger systems that uh, have subcomponents that origin from different simulation engines. So depending on the target applications, we do different code generation. So related efforts for uh, equation-based modeling have actually been done in the building industry. For example, with uh, the first approach with the ANET effort from Low and Sorrel, then the Spank uh, software that evolved into Spark, or the neutral model format, which is now the underlying language of the ida Eyes tool. So those approaches really uh, were groundbreaking in that area, but now we have new standards and a much larger community from different uh, industri industrial sectors that develop this technology and tools like Ida Eyes actually start also implementing and supporting those new uh, modeling languages for building applications. So why standardization? So let's step back a moment and see how we have been developing building simulation programs. So in the past, we basically all developed our own building simulation program. But they each had a mutually incompatible model format, different semantics, and incompatible software architecture. So we developed Trace, Equest, Contem, Transys, etc. And someone is happily really paying for this development, but the user complained about lack of functionality, difficulty to use, and it was really not transparent of how to use those models. Very importantly, it was also not possible to exchange models among each other. So if a model has been implemented, for example, in BLAST, it was very hard, if not impossible, to use that in ESPR or in Transys. So they were mutually incompatible. 25 years ago, there was this brilliant recognition that models can be written once in an equation-based language called neutral model format, start in a repository, and then export it to different simulators. So NMF is now the language that is uh, used in the ida I software, but at that point is probably ahead of its time. Unfortunately, the whole effort was really stopped by ASHRAE TC 4.7, and I think we would be in a very different position if that work would have been continued within the building community as opposed to being restricted to one tool offering. 
So in the absence of uh, sharing models among each other, there uh, was a flurry of activities for co-simulation. So Energy Plus was coupled to Quantum, GEMS was coupled to Transis, ESBR was coupled to uh, Transis. They all used uh, one-off implementation of this uh, exchange format, and again, there was no compatibility. I tried to develop uh, and uh, released uh, software that had a master algorithm and interfaces then for a multitude of those tools to unify how to simulate or co-simulate those systems. It was really a nice CD at that point, but it lacked a standard and a formal framework until some tools really started using functional mockup interface. So let me switch now to some of those enabling technologies and standards that we have been discussing in the past few slides. So luckily it turns out that there are robust standards uh, that we can use and there's really no need to reinvent the wheel. For example, Modelica is an open industry driven standard for multiphysics modeling that has been developed since more than 20 years now. And it's used, for example, in Germany to optimize about 7% of the power production in real time based on uh, Modelica technologies. Function mockup interface is an open standard that allows us to exchange uh, models or simulators in uh, source code form or in a compiled form. It is supported by more than 150 tools and it is really a robust implementation now of such an exchange format. So why would we use those standards now? So these standards really allows us on one side to leverage huge investments in related industries that also do simulation it, they also provide a well-tested API for software integration, and maybe most importantly, provides to industry a stable basis for investment. Because we know that those standards, they evolve in a robust format, and it's not a one-off implementation that typically comes out of a research lab or university that may cease to exist once a student leaves or once the professor decides to focus on other areas. And it also avoids us to do a vendor locking because we have open standards. It allows us to use different implementations of them. So to understand the next few slides, let me briefly explain how models are implemented in the Modelica language. So Modelica is basically a compositional language that's declarative. So we start, for example, in for a simple heat conductor model by using a so-called connector or heat pot that defines a temperature and the variable Qflow, which has a flow prefix, so it's a flow variable. This connector is then used in a heat capacitor model that defines a power meter, which is a heat capacity. It defines a variable temperature, and it instantiates this heat pot. And then there's an equation section that says that the temperature is equal to the pot dot T temperature, and the evolution of the temperature, so the differential equation, is the heat capacity times the time derivative, and that's equals to the heat flow rate at that part. So those uh, statements are then encapsulated and uh, augmented with an icon. And then through drag and drop, you can put that into a system model and then use, for example, a connect statement that's automatically generated when you draw a line between those heat parts that connects the part of this heat conductor A with the part of a heat radiation model B. This connect statement is then expanded when I mean, the model is being translated into the conservation equation that the uh, temperatures have to be the same at both parts and the heat flow rate has to sum up to zero. So it's really a very graphical language where we did not say how the system is being simulated, but rather it gives us a means to express mathematically how the system should behave. So those systems are then used together with algorithms for translation and simulation to generate, for example, a code for time domain simulation. So for that, they undergo a translation process. So we start with the object-oriented model representation that we saw before. Then it goes through a parser that eliminates all the object orientation. So we ended up with a large set of equations. Then the symbolic process are being used that does, for example, index reduction of high order differential algebraic equation. It also does uh, block lower triangulation and tiering, automatic differentiation, 
and eventually we get the uh, equations in the form that we can use to generate code. Typically C code is generated and then those systems are compiled to executable. So key operations here are really the uh, index reduction, which is not needed for all systems, but the block lower triangulation and the tiering that's uh, very important to achieve high uh, runtime efficiency. So let me explain quickly how they work. So let's consider a very simple uh, system here where we have three equations. Q is equal to T1 minus T2, T1 is equal to zero, and we have a function that depends on time, which is equal to the temperature one plus temperature two. So using these three equations, uh, those tools form an incidence matrix where we have on the top the variables, uh, they are represented by these columns and the rows are the number of equations. So now we color gray where we have a, a incidence. For example, T1 is used in equation 1, 2 and 3, whereas T2 is only used in equation 1 and in equation 3. Now we can start rearranging this equation as you would do on a sheet of paper. So that's being done by a method called block lower triangulation. So we want to get the system in a triangular form. And now we can compute T1 using equation 2. We can compute T2 using equation 3 because we know T1. And finally, we can compute Q using T1 and T2 from equation 1. So that's how you also would solve it uh, on a sheet of paper. But that can be employed automatically to very large system of equations to cut down really the uh, effort to solve those systems. And in some cases you end up then with very small system equation that are coupled and then afterwards everything becomes explicit again. So let's consider a very simple example to explain tiering. So that's a trick to really reduce the dimension of the system of equation that need to be solved simultaneously using some iterative methods. So in tiering, let's suppose we have now an equation zero is equal to f of x and that we can write our equation in the form that some uh, lower triangular matrix L uh, is multiplied with x1. That gives us a subset of this uh, function f1. And the second equation is zero is equal to some function f2 that depends on x1 and x2. So on the right hand side, you see a very simple example of uh, such a system. So how would you solve this in an efficient way? So the trick here is really that we can uh, rewrite uh, this equation here and pick a guess value for x2, because with x, uh, equation one, if L has the right properties, we can solve for x1 and then plug in x1 into the second equation. So for the system of equation shown on the right hand side here, rather than solving a two by two system of equation, we can assume now a value for x2, compute x1, plug that into the second equation, compute x2 and use this new value and substitute it back in again into the equation one. So we reduced our uh, equation from a two by two system to a one by one system. And those are much easier and much more robust to solve. So let me explain now how some of these uh, technologies can be used to integrate the tool chains for design, deployment and operation. So one approach that we are using here to support uh, new HVAC systems and also design flows is uh, based on the Modelica Billings library. So we have been developing a very large uh, library of Modelica models for building energy systems that covers air-based system, hydronic system, multi-zone uh, heat transfer in buildings, but also multi-zone air exchange uh, between different uh, thermal zones. We can couple in uh, CFD approaches, and we can also couple then thermal system to electrical systems in a graphical way. So that's implemented through the Modelica Billings Library that is being used now by a lot of control provider and equipment manufacturers to develop new products. So Modelica is very strong on modeling HVAC and other energy systems as well as controls. 
was energy plus has a very strong billing envelope models. So the question was really how do we combine the strengths of those two models to develop a tool that allows us to reuse parts of energy plus, in particular for the envelope modeling, and combine it with these new approaches that allows us to look at actual control implementation and implement those models into digitized uh, workflows, for example, for control delivery, or to look at new system architectures, either on the building level or on the district level. That led to the development of Spawn of Energy Plus, where we are packaging parts of Energy Plus, primarily for the envelope simulation as a function mockup unit, and couple them behind the scenes to Modelica for the HVAC and control simulation. And we're also working now on uh, embedding uh, this technology into uh, one uh, package that also contains then the Optimica compiler so that the uh, users can generate the simulation models or functional mockup units at no cost to them using these open free standards. So Spawn allows then the typical Modelica look and feel. So you have illustrated here, based on a very simple system, uh, uh, control sequence on the bottom here that uses a control uh, description language that I'm going to explain a little bit later. We have a very simple HVAC system from the Modelic Buildings Library. Here we just have a fan and a heater for illustration. And on the top we have this uh, blue icon and this icon automatically sets up then a coupled simulation between Modelica and Energy Plus via the FMI interface. So it's a kind of co-simulation that we set up, but it's done completely behind the scenes from the end user. So for the end user, all you have to do is basically do this graphical plug and play modeling, and it will create then automatically the coupled simulation. In a larger uh, setup, uh, such system model may look like this one here, where on the top left here, we have an implementation of the control logic. Then this yellow indicated here is a central air handler unit. In green, we have a VAV distribution and terminal boxes. And then in blue is a multi-zone billing and envelope model that uses Spawn of Energy Plus with the coupling then to the Energy Plus during uh, runtime. So the question is really, how do we make best practice control now widely available and bring it from simulation to actual buildings? So as I mentioned earlier, programming error is one of the leading cause of control-related problems in commercial buildings. And for that, we are developing now a digitized workflow and a standard to express control sequences between simulation and actual implementation. So we are working through the Open Building Control Project on a digitization of the control delivery process, process that breaches BAM with building operation. So this will allow the designer to do performance assessments through the Modelica Buildings Library or through Spawn of Energy Plus, export the control specification in a vendor-independent format, provided that the control provider, so the control provider can bid on the job, and then translate that to their native implementation using machine-to-machine -machine translation. And the commissioning agent will then have uh, the formal specification of the control sequence in the form of a digital twin and use that to verify that the as-installed control sequences conform to the design specification. So the missing piece for that is really a language for expressing the control logic. So Ashri has developed, for example, a standard 135 BACnet for data communication. Ashri is also developing a standard for semantic modeling, so standard 223P. The control sequences being published by Ashri, the guideline 36 uh, publication, which is essentially is a Word or PDF documentation that uh, explains in English language how to uh, control commercial building systems. But what's really missing is a language to express the control logic that can be used for simulation, but also for implementation on uh, building automation systems. So we have been developing this uh, language called Control Description Language that is now undergoing an ASHRAE standardization process. We also prototyped the machine-to-machine -machine translation from this Control Description Language to a commercial building automation system from Automated Logic. And what you see here is now the one-to-one -one translation that has been done via 
machine to machine translation. So on the left you see the Modelica implementation or the control description language, which is a subset of Modelica. And you see, for example, on the top left, the two PI controller, and uh, below that, the active airflow set point uh, uh, control sequence. That is being translated to the PI controller from uh, web control, so that's a product from automated logic, and also hierarchically uh, control sequences or control logic has been generated, for example, for the active airflow set point or for controlling the dampers and the valves. So CDL will then really allow translation from those uh, models that can be used for simulation and for testing of control sequence to existing control product lines. So that goes then eventually through a JSON intermediate format that we are standardizing now through ASHRAE. And so that you can then uh, translate it further to different uh, control implementation once this control provider implement those translators because at that point you typically need to know a proprietary knowledge of how a control system of those different vendors is working. At the same time, because we do use a proper subset of Modelica, you can use the whole Modelica ecosystem for this translation as well if you develop, for example, a next generation control product line. So I could envision that in the future, if someone comes up with a new building control product line that they are using uh, new standards like the EFMI standards that has specifically been designed to translate the models for use in real-time application. The other standards also like uh, SSP, system structure and parametrization that allows them to couple those different computing units to form complete uh, uh, control sequence or complete systems that represent uh, larger a building automation system together with a plant model, for example. So one part that those standards really help addressing, particularly EFMI standards, is that for model use during operation, you typically require a superhero. So that doesn't really scale. So just consider, for example, that we have a real process, for example, a, a building system, and we have some control function and we want to uh, reduce the cost for sensors. The typical approach that's being done in various community is to uh, create a so-called observer. That's basically a model of the real process that allows us to uh, compute or simulate uh, sensor signals. And then rather than implementing a real sensor, we can compute what this sensor would measure and so that reduce, for example, cost by using this so-called virtual sensor. If you want to do that in a robust way, you really need this superhero here that doesn't really scale. So this function developer really needs to understand controls engineering in terms of system theory, stability, etc. Uh, that person needs to understand physical modeling for how to uh, create such a physical model. So a significant domain knowledge needed for that by that person. They also need to be specialist in numerics in terms of stability, runtime precision, and what algorithm is working best for those approaches. And they also need to understand the target software in order to generate code for that platform. So that really does not scale. There are not ma many of those uh, superheroes in the industry. So because of this increased complexity, the higher requirements on uh, runtime performance and the lack of these superheroes was uh, the development of a new standard called EFMI started. So that allows us now to decompose the system so that the physical modeling expert can focus on the modeling, the controls engineer can develop the control model, and then there are tool chains that combine them with numerical services, efficient libraries, and also code generation, for example, for embedded computing units where we leverage then the domain expertise of software developers. The EFMI standard allows us then to go from modeling to uh, running those models as part of a simulation environment, as we do today, or as part of an embedded computer, possibly on very low cost hardware. But the key of that is that we can have a formal process that allows us to have guarantee runtime properties and using open standards to achieve that. 
So for example, we can use a model and still do a simulation as part of design flow. We can also test this code here, then as part of a software or hardware in the loop. And if you go to actual production code, we can use the same model, transform that into algorithmic code using a language called Gallic that allows to do a reasoning and analysis of this code and then transform it to production code that has guaranteed runtime properties in terms of memory requirement, execution time, and also guarantees that there are no floating point exceptions. And this production code can then be translated to different target platforms that can range from usual computers all the way down to very low cost hardware. So with that approach, we really allow now reusability and integration of these different domain, domain experts. So how do we go now from components to whole systems? So we now have a standard for expressing those components, but eventually we want to arrive at whole systems that integrate either different physical models or integrate physical models with data-driven approaches or with some other analytics. SSP is an emerging standard, it's called System Structure and Parametrization, that does exactly that. So you can embed or encapsulate different computing units in a function mockup interface standard or in other computing units. So it's basically an input-output mapping. If you look at it in an abstract way, that may have physics in there or controls or data-driven approaches or machine learning algorithm. And SSP allows us now to combine them using an open standard that's tool independent and uh, the standard is layered so it allows an integration across different software stacks and uh, deploy then this combined system for example as a service uh, for in the context of a digital twin of a building so that allows us now to use again a standard and so that hopefully have longevity and uh, promising pass forward in order to support and maintain those uh, digital twins over the lifetime of a building. So let me close with two slides. First, I want to explain the R&D needs in this uh, ecosystem, and that can be looked at in terms of these uh, pyramids here. So at the very bottom, we need a robust foundation in terms of domain-specific model libraries, numerical solvers for simulation, and also for optimization. Then on top of that, we have modeling infrastructure that uses those libraries, like for example, Modelli for Billings library, provide uh, user-facing uh, uh, editing capabilities, and also a framework then for multi-scale distributed simulation optimization of those systems. To integrate then the, those uh, technology into a process, we'll need the means to link uh, functional requirements, digital models, and actual systems together at different levels of abstraction. So you might have a different abstractions if you develop a local loop control or supervisor control, or whether you try to figure out what energy system uh, should be installed in a district. So we have these different levels of abstractions with refinements in there that allows us then to do a model-based design and operation of an engineered system. But key of that is really that we have robust standards in place to do that, as opposed to one of approaches that try to get something to run, but doesn't really scale up and doesn't provide us a structured way to integrate our domain-specific knowledge with advances in other industrial sectors. So the future is really all about the integration of different technologies. We as building simulation experts we have in-depth knowledge about engineering and physics of buildings. But there are other sectors in the engineering community that have in-depth knowledge about modeling, so how to best model data, or how to best model behavior of systems in terms of a, a simulation model. There are other industrial sectors that are very strong on applied mathematics for simulation, for optimization, or for machine learning. There are experts in development of tool chains that connect, for example, design and operation. And key to move forward is really how do we integrate these different technologies with each other. And for that, I think open standards are really critical in order to collaborate, not just within the building community, but within the larger engineering community. And I think that's really needed if you want to achieve the goal of quite efficient 
flexible building, a district energy system that are resilient to extreme weather events, that are resilient to technology change, and that can evolve over the, the future in order to rapidly provide decarbonized system that make a key contribution to reduce the impact of uh, climate change. With that, I would like to thank you for joining this webinar on behalf of the International Building Performance Simulation Association.